Good morning. Good afternoon, Dr. Janelle. Good Lisa. afternoon. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Perfect. So I thank you so much for being here today to talk about the many things that you are doing in STEM and also the wonderful work that you are doing at your practice. So we know that you are a STEM champion in your community for minority youth. Could you please tell us about your STEM story, Dr. Davison? Well, thanks for having me today, Milton. So my STEM story is pretty similar to most young people, especially young girls of color. At an early age, I always kind of knew I wanted to be involved in healthcare. Um, I took a liking to science early on. Um, math, I did well in, but I really liked science. Um, as my mother tells me, since about maybe six, I always said I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I used to want to be a pediatrician. I kind of changed pathways a little further down into my college career. But my STEM story was I always wanted to be involved in healthcare. I took a liking to taking care of patients. I took a liking to education. Um, and so I just set along that path, I exposed myself to a lot of various options and opportunities that was out there to expose me to various career options. Um, I found some mentors, and I said mentors because it was a husband and wife who were both internal medicine doctors, um, and they were of color, so you don't see that often, um, and they were in my church. So I shadowed them, and I spent a lot of time with them. Um, I made sure I did well in my science and math classes. Um, anytime that I can volunteer, I did because I like people and being of service, so I was one of those individuals that applied for National Honor Society. And the counselor came to me and said, you don't need us. We need you. You have, I've never had a, a person apply in high school with so much community service hours. I was that kid that was volunteering at the Children's Hospital. I was a candy striper. I did all those things on my own because I really wanted to my, immerse myself in the healthcare culture and just being of service. And so I just stayed along that path all the way through college. Um, I like to say in college I did well, but it wasn't easy. I had to work very hard, um, and I continued to shadow. I continued to volunteer, and then around sophomore year, I decided I wanted to go into optometry, um, mainly because after a while, you just get tired. <laughs> it's a lot of work, a lot of studying, and I wanted to find a path that I could still pursue um, health care, being of service, but maybe shave down on some years of schooling. And so I matriculated to the Pennsylvania College of Optometry in Philadelphia, and so 14 years later, I've been practicing optometry in the Georgia area, and I still bring that mindset of service and taking care of my patients. I'm heavily involved in my community. Um, I have an internship program through the local high school that students come through. I've had over 30 high school students come through and shadow with me um, in the eight or 10 years that I've been here. Um, and then from that, I stemmed, um, birthed my own nonprofit because I wanted to be able to expose and help more girls than just out of that one high school. So here I am now, living out my best life, <laughs> joining healthcare and science and um, taking care of eyeballs all day. <laughs> that is also awesome. But I thank you very much um, for this great elaboration on the very first question. I think uh, that is the end of our interview because you have pretty much answered all the many questions. <laughs> No, just kidding. So we have uh, more questions to come for you. I'm not going to let you go that easy. <laughs> okay. okay. But good questions coming up. So in your practice at Brilliant Eyes Vision Center, you have a great passion for these conditions like dry eye disease, uh, diabetic eye disease. How could one recognize uh, the symptom or symptoms of any of this disease, Dr. Janelle? Well, that's a good question. Of the two, um, in the early stages, dry eye is actually going to be a lot more symptomatic for a patient. Usually, if you have constant redness of the eyes, um, constant burning of the eyes, um, regular itching, or a regular sensation that you always feel like you have something in your eye, sand or a gritty sensation, that could be a high indication that you may be suffering from dry eye disease. Um, diabetes is a little tougher because you may have signs of diabetic retinopathy or diabetic eye disease and not necessarily be symptomatic. Um, so that's why it's very important when you're first diagnosed with diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, 
that usually recommend within six months or really immediately after you're diagnosed that you go have a full thorough examination, mainly focusing on the retina, looking for signs of bleeding and hemorrhaging. Because a lot of times you may have changes that are early on that are not symptomatic that need to be properly monitored and managed. So I tell my patients a lot of conditions can start early and you see perfectly fine. A lot of the eye conditions are painless. A lot of them don't have symptoms. So a lot of times you will be um, jaded in the fact that things are healthy unless you actually have somebody evaluating your eyes you really don't know. All right. So that is uh, very good to know. So I hope uh, the listeners uh, may have questions or wonder about uh, certain things that are happening uh, to their health. Uh, especially eye health, and they can pay good attention to what you are saying. And if they have questions and they know exactly, they can get in touch with you. So even though they may not be in your state, do you, do you think that they can get in touch with you? So since you are located in the state of Georgia? Yes, definitely. I'm on all the social media platforms. I'm pretty responsive to emails and any DMs or private messages. Okay. Um, I do a lot of webinars on those platforms that are a good place for you to ask questions if you need to know more about your eye health and overall health. Okay. That is so wonderful. And I thank you very much uh, for this answer. So, besides your practice at Brilliant Eyes Vision Center, you are very active and involved in many other uh, projects, uh, STEM project. Could you please uh, tell us some more about these projects and how, and how our viewers uh, can get in touch with you, Doctor? So one of the main um, still projects that I'm involved with is SCORE, SCORE Inc. And SCORE stands for Successful, Confident, Optimistic, Regal, and Engaging. That was a 501c3 nonprofit that was founded in 2017 by my sister and myself. We are both um, STEM girls. Um, she's a science major as well, and she's currently a practicing dentist in Charlotte. Um, but we, through SCORE, we help to expose girls and empower girls and encourage them to pursue STEM careers in the healthcare as well as, as, well as technology, mathematics, mathematics, and engineering. We do this through internships. We offer mentorships as well as we have conferences and seminars throughout the year to expose and empower girls. So that's right now how I'm spending a lot of my, my time is exposing young high school girls. We target 13, 14, about 18, and then we have a lot of college students who we allow to mentor to some of um, various providers and um, women who are in the STEM field. So that is also wonderful. Uh, you and your sister are very involved, especially mm -hmm. working with our young people that is so awesome so as a minority person myself i am always alarmed by the stats that i see so whenever i read them sometimes i feel very bad or very uncomfortable so and we do know that every time i will read a stat or whatever African Americans and Hispanics are always on top or the bottom. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, is it a disparity in the healthcare system due to social economic status or the genetics makeup of these individuals? Hear me okay? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Did you hear my okay. question? Okay, yes, you froze a little bit. Yes, I did. Um, so I definitely don't think it's the genetic makeup. Um, I definitely think it's a combination of economics and exposure and just self-confidence. Um, if you always constantly look at those stats, then a lot of times you will force yourself to believe that you're not able to do things that other people can. As a minority who grew up and went to school where I was the minority, I was the only black girl in my sixth grade class, and then I graduated in high school with well over 200 students, only less than 10 were of, of color, and I was the only African-American girl that was in what we call pre-college um, prep classes. So, I, and I was able, I'm not a genius, I just persevere, I work hard, I know what my limitations are. Um, we didn't grow up rich. We found ways to expose me, uh, whether it was through things that were free or things that my family had to pool money together to get me exposed. But I just think that, you know, and that's why I reached back so much to be able to help because it's all about exposure, it's all about confidence, and it's all about encouraging. 
through my whole process, um, I was always encouraged and, and, and exposed to keep pushing forward. Don't let what I see in statistics or other people are not doing to deter me from what I what my dreams are. So I think a lot of it is just, unfortunately, socioeconomic status and just not, you know, believing, falling into those statistics. You know, um, I've gone to school with people who don't look like me and they're not necessarily smarter than me. But sometimes they have opportunities that I may not be afforded because they have the exposure or they're born into a little bit more money. But when I look back out of my graduating class of 200 and I was the only girl of color in this college prep class, I'm the only doctor. So I did, I, there were some who did better than me as far as grades and some who didn't, but I, I believed in myself and I pushed myself and I didn't let obstacles stop me from where I wanted to be because I'm definitely no genius, but I definitely just worked hard. So I think we just need to keep encouraging our brothers and sisters of color because we're definitely um, uh, genetic based the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> each one, if some of us, you know, we have some Caucasians are genius and some African Americans are genius, but most of us fall in the middle. So definitely not the latter exactly exactly so it is all about um encouragement so just the same way uh when i was at the university um i didn't have too many minority uh students in my classes but i knew i had to do well and i had to study hard so sometimes some people think it is genetics so, like you said, I think it is a combination of both. And remember that we minority people, we have been oppressed over the years. So it will take time to overcome yes. such. So not because uh, we are not capable of learning or genetics to some mm -hmm. extent, but I think uh, we can do with help and pushing. And this is exactly I agree. where we need I agree. to be. Uh, role models for those uh, who may look like us. So, in your practice, you see many things. How to choose a good eye doctor and which eye doctor should one see? An That's a great an question. An optometrist or an ophthalmologist? Well, it's, you can see both. But I usually like to tell patients that optometrists think of, of a gateway, a primary care. So I work with a team of ophthalmologists in the event that you need tertiary care. So if you're seeing a very good optometrist, they know what their specializations are and know what their limitations are. Um, and they usually have a team. Most of my ophthalmologist colleagues are surgeons. They don't like to do just regular primary gateway keeping type things. So when a patient is sent to them, whether I'm sending you for a glaucoma specialist, it's because you've gotten to a point where your glaucoma is no longer manageable in my clinic and you may need some tertiary care that involves surgical intervention. Same with cornea. If you have certain eye diseases that have gone on and that's gonna be surgical intervention, that's where my ophthalmology friends like to live. They like surgery. That's one of the major differences between optometrists and ophthalmologists. In most states, we are not doing surgery. There be some minor office procedures that we do, but we don't do surgery. Um, in number-wise, in the state of Georgia, there are like two to one. There's two to more, two to one more optometrists than ophthalmologists. So ophthalmologists like to focus their time on that tertiary specialty care, where. Um, that gateway now is not going to be enough to keep their condition under control and keep their keep them from going blind. So you can go to both, but a lot of times you're going to have a lot longer wait to get an ophthalmologist um, because a lot of times they're specialized and they're doing surgery. And usually if you go to ophthalmology clinic, you're probably seeing an optometrist. They usually have a lot of optometrists that work with them providing that gateway care. So that is uh, a wonderful way uh, to answer this wonderful question. So I hope our people are listening and taking good notes <laughs> so thank you so much so whether someone is um, preparing for his or her first ever visit to an optometrist uh, or is having his or first uh, checkup appointment in a few years it's always a good practice to be prepared what are some important questions you will expect uh, to hear from your patients dr janelle so those are good questions. Um, things that you want to ask when you go, or you want to come prepared. So you want to make sure you know your family history. That's important. You want to make sure that you know and aware of any conditions that you've been diagnosed with and any medications that you're taking. And then also at the conclusion of the exam, you want to find out a couple of numbers. You want to know what your eye pressure is because we screen for glaucoma. That's one screening test. 
So you kind of want to memorize that number. You want to know and ask if you have any added risk for developing glaucoma, cataracts, or macular degeneration. Each exam, we're screening to see if you have those conditions or if you have something that may increase your risk. Um, also, you want to find out if glasses are prescribed for you, are there specific lens treatments that are going to enhance your vision and allow you to see as clear as possible. Um, it's more than just a plastic lens. You want to be able to add treatments and things that are going to enhance your vision as well as protect your vision when you're outside and about. So mainly make sure you have good sun protection, make sure you have blue light protection. Um, so those are some key factors that I usually provide for my patients. But if you're not getting that information, one, you want to know the overall health. And the two, is there any specific treatments that you should have on your lenses to enhance your vision and protect your eyes when you're out and about? Thank you so much. Dr. Janelle, I want to say uh, thank you very much for your time uh, you have given us today, especially the fellow Gislers uh, who are out there watching and listening. So before you go, and I would like to ask you one more question. Okay. Many people fail uh, to keep up with their eye health, which can lead uh, to major complications in the future. What advice do you have uh, for these individuals? So my main advice to my patients, remember the, win the eyes are the windows to the soul and your overall health can affect your eye health as well. Um, so you want to make sure that you are having someone that's thoroughly evaluating your, evaluating your eyes regularly and explain it to you what risk you may have for your sight based on some of your system and health conditions. But I told my patient, I had a patient this morning, I told him, I said, what you need to do is to stay healthy on me. He already had glaucoma and at an early age, and he was borderline for diabetes. And I said, I need you to stay healthy because when you, if you go from borderline to full-blown diabetes, that's going to increase your risk of your glaucoma potentially progressing. So do all that you can to stay healthy, eat right, reduce your stress. If you're not good about eating a balanced diet rich in antioxidants and lutein, then you need to take supplements. Um, take baby steps. Don't overwhelm yourself. Some days are better than no days. So if you forget your vitamins a couple of days, don't fall off the wagon. Just get back on. Stay healthy and then make sure you have a good relationship with an eye doctor, whether it's an optometrist or ophthalmologist. But now it's probably going to be an optometrist. Um, so that way you can make sure that we work collaborative as a team to make sure your eyes are healthy and your overall body is healthy. I thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy day, out of your practice. And I do know at this point, uh, the next patient may be waiting for you. Yes. <laughs> so, and I thank you so much uh, for your time. So, is there any specific way you would like our audience have to get in touch with you. So as far as your practice is concerned and things like that, if they have questions, uh, how they can contact you. So, and I want to say thank you. So, and just go ahead and say okay. whatever you have to say to our fellow students out there. And I would say, Milton, thank you for inviting me on to talk with your viewers. You can reach me via questions email at iCare, E-Y-E-C-A-R-E, -E, at Dr. Janelle, J-A-N-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, od.com. That's my direct email address. Also, my website is drjanelleod.com. You can view um, services that I'm able to do there. And from there, you pretty much can get to all my practices, whether I have my primary care practice and I do have an eye spa where we do advanced dry eye treatment and um, supervise um, cosmetic services with estheticians. Um, and like I said, just I usually tell people, Google me. Google Dr. Janelle Davidson. And I'm going to come up. You're going to find me. You can reach every platform to contact me. I thank you so much, uh, Dr. Janelle. May you have uh, a wonderful weekend. A you too. Wonderful afternoon. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.